Okay, last lecture in this chapter, which is about taking part in government, or what we would call civic action. So normally we show you this because you've already gotten our key terms down, but there is one that I do want to focus on here, which is political action committees, or what are called PACs, P-A-C. So we mentioned in the previous lesson how uh, interest groups, particularly uh, large interest groups, can have power over politicians by denying them campaign funding uh, and, of course, getting their followers to vote for those particular candidates. So political action committees are the financial part of that. So interest groups cannot directly give money to political candidates, uh, but through, um, through legal and financial meandering, they were able to create political action committees is where they collect the money and it's considered a separate entity from the interest group even though they are linked together. So this is how they use money in order to influence candidates and influence sitting representatives and other, uh, other elected officials. So this is a key component here. Now, in the lecture, we're not really going to spend a whole lot of time on it, because that's, so that's why I wanted to take a moment to point this out. So political action committees, when they were started, it was something where you would think like an organization might collect, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, and then they would disperse that among a couple of candidates. Some of the major PACs today can collect hundreds of millions of dollars. So they can influence multiple politicians. And again, this can be good, it can also be bad. There's not just one, one particular view of this. So there are political action committees out there that are for public interest groups that are fighting for clean air and clean water, safer streets, um, more infrastructure, bridges, bridges and roads, and so on and so forth. And there's others out there for specific ones. We talked about um, uh, protecting, protecting gun rights is one very specific one. There are several PACs that focus on that. There's other ones that are focused on getting the most conservative and others that are focused on getting the most liberal candidates elected to office. And they can have a lot of money funneling through them so that they can influence a wide range of politicians or they can target specific ones and make sure that those individuals get elected. So that being said, you don't probably need the whole two minutes for this, but I'm still going to give it to you. Please do not pause the video. Write down what you see on the screen. First is a basic introduction, and then we'll get into each of the categories when the two minutes is up. Okay, so 
taking part in your government, which equals civic participation, at least according to what we are covering, breaks down into four main categories, which is voting, communicating with your representative, community action, and volunteering for campaigns. Those are the main ways that you can participate civically in society. So the one that we have been going over all year long, and it, and it is because it is the most important, it's also because it's the simplest. Voting is the simplest thing you can do to participate civically. It is free, it is not required of you, so there shouldn't be that much pushback to it. But so as we know with voting is the first thing you have to do is get registered so that you, are, you know that you are voting in the right polling place, you know that you are in the right district for where you live. That's the main reason for getting registered. And then it's also knowing your polling place, know where you have to go and vote. If it's something to where if one day you're not living in a metropolitan area or like a big city, and you have to travel a, uh, a good distance away to get to your polling place, you need to know where that is. And that every vote counts, especially in local elections. So there, are, there have been times, too, where, it, depending on which state you live in, even a presidential election can come down to a handful of votes. So that's why, um, now it may not come down to one, but... The way you got to think about it is this, is that if you stay at home and you don't vote, there's probably like 10 other people that are thinking the exact same way. So those tens, that one can multiply into 10, 10 can multiply into 100, 100 into 1,000, so on and so forth. So that's why you have to, everyone should have the mentality of doing all that they can to get out and vote. Now, in local elections, it can come down to one vote. There have been multiple people who have won, whether it be a, st you know, a state representative, even a mayor or a city council member, who has won by a singular number of votes. So that's why that's important. And there is a problem in the United States of people not going out and voting. Typically in a very good year, and it's, it usually happens every four years during presidential elections. That's when people get motivated to get out and vote. But you're still only talking about like 60% of the entire American populace comes out to vote. That can vote. Not 60% of the total population. 60% of the population that could be registered gets out, registers, and votes. So all those other people. And that's in a good year. So... Case in point, the last election cycle here in the state of Louisiana, 32% of registered voters came out to vote. Less than half of the eligible population came out to vote for our governor, for the executive of this state. And that is a problem because then you're just allowing those 32% of people to choose for you. So. And we'll get to uh, community action on the next one, too. So we'll leave it a voting there. And we'll go ahead and give you two minutes to get the last three topics down. And then I'll start when the timer hits zero.
All right, so we had a few technical good difficulties there. So, um, but main part is is that uh, you can keep writing. I'm not going to go too much off book here. So, your next way of civic participation is communicating with representatives. So, the first step in this is should be fairly obvious, but it's know your representative. Now, you can contact any representative at the federal, state, or local level. But if you don't live in their districts or in their states, they're not going to pay much attention to you. But unless, of course, it is like, say, the President of the United States, because they represent, they're supposed to represent everybody in the United States. So, but that's still their district. Now, so you need to know who your representatives are. This is a problem in the United States. This is a problem in the state of Louisiana. Not that you, for this class, you're excused because most of you will have not voted. You're just turning voting age. You've just gotten registered, right? But before you go out and vote, you need to know not just the candidates, but you need to know who your current representatives are. You need to know who your states or who your U.S. senators are. You need to know who your state senator is, who your state rep is who your U.S. House representative is. You need to know those things. One is, so if you want to bring up an issue to them, you know who to contact. So you can either write an email, you can call into their office, you can go old fashioned and write them a letter. Those are ways of communicating with them. You can meet them out on the campaign trail. If you know they're making a public appearance, you can show up to try and have a word or two with them, whether it's polite or a little combative. But, so those are ways that you can communicate with your representatives. But you need to know who they are. That is one of the singular most important things when understanding civics, is knowing the people that represent you. And if you know that they don't, if they're not representing your interest, then you know that you need to get out and vote for a candidate that would, or you need to decide that you need to run for that office so that you can represent your interests as well as your communities. So then that leads into community action. So this is the most local way that you can contribute civically. And this is simply by volunteering. So that can take on various different, uh, various different aspects. That can be from community service, helping clean up your community, uh, volunteering to work a polling station during an, an election day. Uh, you can volunteer to do various different things around your neighborhood and your city and your state to help improve it. Um, now, of course, remember the main thing about volunteering is, is that it does not pay. That's why most people stayed away, stay away from it. Now, if volunteering isn't your thing, so you can start neighborhood organizations. Simple thing is what they used to have in the old days, it doesn't seem to be around that much anymore, is neighborhood watches. So it's a simple thing of you, you communicate with the people in your neighborhood and make sure that everybody knows that they see anything suspicious that they report it, whether that be to fellow members of your neighborhood and community or to local law enforcement. Uh, but there's various other organizations, after school programs or uh, things that you open to the public or organizations that you open to the public that are geared towards things that, things that you like. If even something as simple as a book club among friends, that is a neighborhood organization. That's still community action because you're promoting, uh, promoting reading, promoting education, promoting group conversation, all that works. And of course, you could always take the next step based off of what you know here, you can create your own interest group. If there's an issue that is facing you and your community and your neighborhood that you feel that needs to be addressed that's not being addressed, you can start your own interest group. You can start raising awareness on your own. Bring in other people to go and campaign on those issues. That doesn't mean that you have to run for office, but you can find people running for office that will deal with your particular issues and then you can start to get things done without having to be directly involved in politics. And then the other 
final one is that you can volunteer for campaigns. Now, before I launch and finish up this one, the one that we don't have on here and should be fairly obvious at this point too is that now again in this we're talking about simple ways that you can participate in government. A complex way can always be running for office yourself. Uh, typically, well, in the state of Louisiana, you can start at the age of 18 to start running for political offices. And throughout, uh, in most other states, it's going to be 25 years old. So once you get out of college, you can, st and if that's the thing that you would like to do, it doesn't require a degree or anything like that, you can start campaigning to run for, uh, for local offices. And you should already know the age regulations for national offices. So that being said, if that's not something in your, uh, in your mindset right now, or you might even think, well, maybe one day, you can always get out and volunteer for campaigns. So again, this is volunteering. So you're giving up your free time, but it should be for somebody that you actually believe in, somebody that you think has good talking points, somebody that would make a good politician, or somebody who's running for re-election that you think is a good representative or a good politician. And so when you volunteer for that, you're helping them get, you're helping get out the word. The way that you see it around town here is some people volunteer and they go out and they put in signs in the medians, in the, in the neutral grounds around the city. On election, on voting days, whether it's early voting or uh, on actual election day, people are standing out there with signs trying to get awareness about candidates. So when people do go and vote, they have that candidate fresh in their mind. You can even work on the backside of everything, which is you help organize these events. You can uh, send out mailers. You can be somebody who works in an office and just do a couple, an hour or two a day, and you help that person get elected. Um, you can help that campaign get people out to polls and pass elections. You've had campaigns, particularly in rural areas, they will have transportation to get people from their home to their, to their uh, polling place and get them back. Um, and the other part of this is that it can lead to a profitable career if you are good at it, if you are good at managing aspects of a campaign. So one thing is, is that if you build on that for several years, if you have a successful track record and you, and you help get several people elected, you might one day be in charge of an entire campaign for a politician and you get to charge whatever rate that you want. If it is a national campaign, say, or if it is a federal or even a state position, if you do really well, that person who got elected might bring you on to their staff and then, then you are part of uh, still participating and you are helping. No, you're no longer volunteering because now you're getting paid. Uh, so, for example, and in closing, President Obama, when he was elected, a lot of the people that worked on his campaign, so a lot of the people that walked around going door to door, knocking on doors, trying to get people to come out and vote for President Obama during the primary season in states like New Hampshire and Iowa, they ended up on his, on his White House staff. And then now they've gone on to other careers, being panelists on news programs or having their own TV shows where they analyze politics in the news and things like that. So get out and participate. That is it for today.